Excellencies, dear colleagues, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to who is with us on WebEx and to who is now joining us on Facebook Live. It is a real pleasure to be back uh, with you again. The Geneva Environment Network has the pleasure to welcome you today virtually for the launch of the Geneva Beat Plastic Pollution Dialogues, organized in collaboration with the Basel, Rotterdam and Stockholm Convention Secretariat, the Center for International Environmental Law, the Global Governance Center at the Graduate Institute, Norway and Switzerland. For those who don't know yet our platform, we are a network of more than 100 institutions and secretariats based in Geneva that make this region one of the global hubs for environmental governance. Administrated by the United Nations Environment Programme and supported by Switzerland, we organize various networking activities, including regular multi-stakeholder roundtables and briefings on major environmental trends. For this first session of the Geneva Beat Plastic uh, Pollution Dialogues, uh, we will focus on plastics and waste. And uh, we are delighted to have with us this morning Bruno Pozzi, who is the um, um, Director for Europe of the United Nations Environment Programme, who will uh, welcome you in a few seconds uh, to this uh, event. We have also with us uh, the Executive Secretary of the Basel, Rotterdam and Stockholm Convention, Rolf Payet. We have from Nairobi, Leticia Carvalho, who is the head of the Marine and Freshwater Branch uh, at the, the Ecosystems Division of the United Nations Environment Programme. Um, she will focus uh, on the work that UNEP is doing on a marine leader. From uh, Ghana, we have with us Sam Adukumim, who is a, the director of the Chemicals Control and Management Center of Ghana and um, Sam is, is very active and very well known for who works on, on chemicals uh, governance uh, at the global uh, level. We have uh, from Switzerland with us Felix Vertli, the head of uh, the Global Affairs Section uh, of Switzerland, also very well known in the global uh, chemicals uh, uh, governance uh, uh, community. And uh, from Norway we have with us Ingeborg Mark Knuston, a senior advisor at the Ministry of Climate and Environment in Norway. He's also a, a well-known uh, environmental uh, negotiator at the global level. And from Geneva, the last uh, speaker today will be David Azoulay, the director of the Environmental Health Programme at the Center for International Environmental Law, one of the organizations co-organizing this series of events. I think I can now turn to you, Bruno, who, as you will deliver the opening remarks of this uh, event. Bruno, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot, Diana, and I hope you can hear me well. Can you confirm? Yes, I can. Okay, wonderful. Thanks, thanks, and uh, welcome to everyone, to all the panelists and all the four people, for, uh, colleagues following uh, online this, this event, which uh, is a really uh, important moment in uh, uh, the Geneva Environment Network calendar as we uh, um, are going to speak about global governance on plastic in from from Geneva and in Geneva and as you know and as Diana just said uh, Geneva is one of the global center for uh, uh, for world governance for environmental governance so it's really a pleasure to welcome you and uh, to be with you thanks a lot to uh, the Con confederation to the Swiss confederation for the support they give to the gen and thanks to all panelists for uh, taking their time to to uh, be part of this important moment. The world, as you know, is facing a, a plastic crisis and uh, we know that the status quo cannot be an option. And this fight against plastic pollution has uh, become even more uh, uh, visible these days with the COVID-19 pandemics. We use disposable masks, gloves, protective equipments, and as we fight the pandemic, we produce even more plastic. So we need to address this uh, so that the pollution doesn't increase even more. And there are many initiatives, projects, governance responses and options that have been developed to tackle this important environmental problem. But the coordination uh, uh, is, is, is key in making it a, a good solution. And we can have a lead uh, to a more effective and efficient response to the plastic pollution. In Geneva, we've got a number of actors that are engaged in rethinking the way we manufacture, use, trade, manage plastic. And this is why also we've got this Geneva Beat Plastic Pollution Dialogues uh, that are now taking place 
organized by the Geneva Environment Network with the collaboration of, of Geneva Actors, the Basel Rotterdam and Stockholm Convention, uh, which is based here, uh, and the uh, Rolf's leadership, the Center for uh, International Environment Law, uh, uh, David is with us, and uh, other actors uh, like the Global Governance Center at the Graduate Institute are very active as well here in Geneva. And of course, uh, two important countries uh, that are promoting a global response uh, to the plastic pollution, Norway and Switzerland, and I'm really thankful uh, to have Ingeborg and Felix with us today. Uh, the dialogue that we will have will spread uh, in a few weeks, uh, but it will look at what different stakeholders have achieved at all levels. Uh, it will address the latest research and the latest governance options, and we'll hear from Leticia as well on this. Uh, it will aim to facilitate further engagement, discussions among uh, stakeholders in Geneva, and actors across the region and across the world uh, so that we've got coordinated approaches that can lead to an efficient global decision making uh, uh, process. It, there is a momentum, there is a, a time for action and we need to seize it and I hope that with this dialogue we will contribute to this, uh, 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 to this moment. Uh, thanks to all colleagues, and I forgot Sam as well. Uh, thanks uh, for being with us. Uh, it is uh, really a pleasure to have such an expert on our panel uh, today as we uh, launch this first session of the dialogue. Uh, Diana, uh, back to you. Thank you, Bruno. To help us setting up the scene this morning, I have the pleasure to turn up to Felix, uh, who will uh, introduce us to the policy context uh, of these dialogues. Felix, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Tiana, and uh, good morning to everybody. Thank you very much for organizing this, uh, the start of this uh, series of uh, events. I think it's really great that we have the opportunity to exchange to really uh, link to, to actors in Geneva and contribute to the discussion. The issue of marine plastic pollution is an environmental problem of global dimensions and it requires international response involving all relevant actors at all different levels. And I think a key a milestone, the first milestone was at UNEA 1, 2014, where member states overwhelmingly recognized the global environmental threat of marine plastic pollution. Now it's six years later and we have been working at expert and government level on these issues. We have increased our knowledge on both governance and technical and research related work. UNEA has negotiated further resolution and now in between we have agreed on 13 pages of decision text on this matter. When we from Switzerland look at, the, at this issue, we are asking ourselves certain key questions. And the main one is if the current setting is strong enough to tackle this huge environmental issue. We can look at it from a national perspective and here we have some impressive numbers. Around 14,000 tons of plastic entry the soil and water bodies in Switzerland every year. That means 125 cages of plastic per person. We have the chance to have a well-working waste management system in Switzerland. And this makes that every year and only of these 14,000 tons, only 20, 20 tons end up in the, in the oceans. That means we contribute to 0.0002% of the world total pollution of plastics in the ocean. But also on the national level, we have to do for sure more, and we'll come back to this a bit later in this dialogue. And then we can link the national dimension to the global dimension. And we have recently um, had a report, national report, on the state of the environment in Switzerland. And this report reminded us that about 75% of raw material consumption of Switzerland is cost abroad. So we all know that we live in a globalized, connected world, and we know that national actions are not sufficient in this case, also because we produce a lot abroad, we export, we import, so we cause also a lot of consumption of plastic litter abroad. I think also another uh, example of this uh, global dimension are the system how plastics ends in the oceans. So we all know when the plastic goes to river, one day, one moment in a certain status, it will end in the, in the oceans. It also means if a neighboring country is tackling the issues, but we are not in the position, or vice versa, we are, we are taking measures, but our neighboring country might not be in a position to do, we are still affected by this. So we have to see 
it from a national perspective and also from a global perspective because it's a global issue. So we have seen a number of voluntary actions, initiatives, platform emerging. However, it's a key question for us to check if they're sufficiently coordinated and robust enough. And we know the fast increase of plastic use. Looking at those figures, we strongly doubt that the current regime is enough. More has to be done. And the robust system has to address the entire life cycle. And there really we have to now conclude this shift from this idea, from the past ideas that the main concern, the main task is just to manage the, the waste. We have to come to concept of a circular economy that thinks about the reduction of use, improved design, sustainable substitutes, and so on. And I think here we have to do some further work to think how can we address in a life cycle what is a robust regime to address it? What are voluntary measures we can take? What are more legally binding measures we can take? What are the best steps? These dialogues, they should contribute and hopefully will contribute to this discussion because important milestones are coming up in the near future. We have the BRS COP in July next year. We have the SICM ICCM5 also in July next year. And in particular, we have the UNIA 5, its resume session in February 2022. Those all are moments where we can work to tackle this issue, where we can design and enhance and strengthen our system to have a robust response to this challenge. That would be all for my first intervention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Felix. And we will continue setting up the scene. Uh, I will give the floor to Ingeborg uh, from Norway. Uh, uh, who will address, uh, uh, speak more about the plastics waste as a global crisis. Norway is one of the countries that has been uh, presenting resolutions and pushing for vari in various fora to address the global plastics waste uh, crisis. Ingeborg, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Diana, and um, hello, everyone. As you heard, pre preventing pollution from plastic litter is a key priority for the Norwegian government. And plastics is indeed a great feature of our modern society. It has a number of great benefits that we depend on in our daily lives. Notably, it is designed to last for a long time. And that is also what makes plastic waste a huge problem when it ends up in our environment and in our oceans. As we heard from Felix, this is a truly global issue and no one country can solve this issue alone. Norway has supported a stronger global commitment to deal with this issue since the first UNEA back in 2014. And we also proposed the amendments to the only one existing legally binding agreement, the Basel Convention for stronger control of the global trade in plastic waste back in 2019. Norway believes that a new global agreement that addresses the issue of plastic litter from both sea-based and land-based sources will be the most effective global solution to deal with this issue. Today, we know that the global consumption of plastics is expected to grow in the years to come. And as a result, more and more plastic waste will also be uh, created. We learned uh, that some 2 billion people lack access to basic waste management today. So we need to get smarter about the way we produce, the way we use and dispose of our plastics. We need to put in place measures across the whole value chain of plastics so that we can improve the design of plastic products to make them stay longer in the plastics value chain and as such minimize the generation of plastic waste. We also need to increase the use of secondary plastics material. We heard also that a number of initiatives and activities exist today aiming at addressing the issue of plastic waste and eliminating plastic litter entering the oceans. We have seen action taken in a number of different uh, forests and instruments over the past few years. But as Bruno said this morning, we see that more coordination is needed to make sure that we're actually hitting our target. Currently, there is no global agreement designed to address this issue across the whole life cycle of plastics. And in many ways, the current plastic waste crisis that we're seeing on a global level is due to a lack of good governance. Norway therefore believes that we need to address this issue like we have done with other global environmental challenges. And as I said, there is no global agreement like we have for biodiversity, climate change or hazardous chemicals today. So we believe that such a new global agreement is needed. 
In the beginning of November, the ad hoc open ended expert group met under um, the auspices of UNIA, and there some hundred countries spoke out in favor of such a new agreement to be the most effective global response options to deal with this issue. So that's a very promising uh, outlook for, for us in the years to come. So I welcome very much these uh, plastics dialogues organized uh, by, by Geneva and uh, this is the first session and we are very much looking forward to get good recommendations towards the high level dialogue on plastic governance in February 2021. So I look forward to the discussion today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much Ingeborg. We are now going to move and discuss uh, how the international community is addressing the plastic waste crisis more in depth. Um, We'll start with uh, Rolf Payette, um, who will uh, speak uh, <laughs> on how the Basel Convention, uh, the multilateral agreement uh, on the control of transboundary movements of hazardous wastes and their disposal that he has now already more than has been uh, um, uh, working on for more than 30 years on this issue, is addressing uh, the, the plastic waste. Rolf, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Diana. Can you load up my presentation, please? And a very good morning, afternoon, and evening to everyone following our session this morning. Um, next slide, please. So, as you can see from this quick slide, uh, we since the adoption of the Basel Convention, plastic uh, waste has been kind of the radar. But uh, I think the real momentum started when the media, NGOs, and others started to push the issue of plastics and this went up the political ladder and then we had uh, leaders being concerned about plastics and then we started uh, moving with by industry a movement by industry and and movement by a number of international organizations in fact this morning i was reading an article about a, a un world tourism organization initiative together with the Makata foundation and unep where they are bringing together the hotels. And as you know, hotels are a significant producer of plastic waste because uh, uh, this is one area where, where you handle single use plastics in such a, a, a huge amount. And coming from a tourism destination, I know full well the challenges of dealing with single use plastics, such as uh, uh, water bottles and of course, solutions for suntan and whatnot. So, so there has been really a ramping up of, of activities and in the Basel Convention, the real work we, we did started with technical guidelines in 2002, but leading up to, of course, this for me, the, 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 real, the real impact started when we adopted the plastic amendments and that really sent home the message to countries that they need to take responsibility for managing their waste and we all need to take collective responsibility for ensuring that the waste of pla the plastic waste doesn't end up into the environment, especially in the oceans. And the Basel Convention amendment, which was uh, proposed by Norway, was quite um, innovative in, in its approach, really, because it, it looked at how we can formalize a bit more of the trade in plastics by making it more transparent, making it more, uh, uh, more in terms of segregation, the different types of plastics. And I'll get to that in the next slide. So, so as you know, the plastic uh, waste amendment becomes effective on the 1st of January. So we have but a couple of months, well, not even a couple of months to really get things moving uh, there. But that's really good news because um, when an amendment becomes effective, it means that countries need to put in the measures that are prescribed by the um, prescribed by the amendment for them to be remain compliant to the to the uh, to the convention. So let's move on. Next slide. So what are the elements of the plastic waste pan, pan, uh, amendment? Like I've mentioned before, they uh, call for modifications to a number of annexes under the Basel Convention. And this is to do with uh, how we uh, plastic, how, um, how we deal with plastics, and now plastics are subject to the prior informed consent. And as a result, when countries uh, import export uh, plastic waste and import plastic waste, the peak procedure will need to be fulfilled. And secondly, it also looks at the scope, the types of plastics, uh, the nature of the plastics, whether they're clean, unclean. 
a mix and that kind of stuff. And thirdly, of course, it looks at the recycling or the end result uh, of the plastics. And this is a very important issue because what we've seen is large amounts of plastics being sent to countries who don't really have the capacity to recycle plastics. So, so this amendment also attempts to address this. Of course, the amendments are, 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 are in themselves amendments within the convention, but the, the, the repercussions of the amendments, in my view, is, is quite deep because it can go down to the, even the curbside because for us to be able to implement, for countries to be able to implement those amendments, they will need to put in place legislation, policies, guidelines, standards, and even change some of the operations when it comes to waste management to ensure that they can segregate the plastic waste, that the plastic waste can be traced and also be identifiable. To just give two examples, uh, let's move on. Next slide. Now, what are the expected impacts of the plastic waste amendments? This is an improvement of my previous slide, which looks a bit more nicer and more beautiful. As I said before, it will pro promote recycling because once the countries feel that it is their responsibility or to take on the responsibility, once export is tightened, then as we've seen in many countries, the plastic waste will pile up at the national level. And when it piles up at the national level, then it's up to the nation to decide how it wants to deal with this plastic. Some countries are saying we're going to go and burn the plastics to turn into energy, but of course the the, the, the time needed to set up such, such industries uh, is quite lengthy and where to locate them and all this. So it will take some time before or actually this comes through. But on the other hand, what we've seen is, um, and this is what I've been told to me by the recycling industry, is that there is now a renewed interest in looking and supporting and incentivizing the recycling industry. So there, this is the feedback I'm getting from the recycling industry. Obviously, a lot needs, a lot more needs to be done, but countries are already moving to see how they can promote more recycling. Environmentally sound management uh, facilities are very, very important because we need to ensure that the countries that we are sending the plastic waste to, to those have the facilities in place. And I think uh, this will be an impact. So we've seen some countries who have taken the the position of banning all imports of plastics or only specifying certain types of plastics and the certain conditions uh, are required for import. So we've seen a lot of movement in that respect. Um, in, pro, in, in, in terms of uh, design and uh, the life cycle approach, we've seen obviously because uh, recyclers demand a certain quality of uh, of uh, of uh, waste plastic waste you you won't imagine but uh, but they need a certain quality of, of 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 plastic waste for them to to be able to recycle effectively and of course cost effectively this is send the repercussions down the line in terms of how we promote how we do packaging for example now we are mixing different types of plastics in packaging we are adding additives which is contaminating other types of plastics so obviously these kinds of changes and discussions with the recyclers is, is sending the message up the up the life cycle to ensure that uh, there's innovation now. There's much better, uh, for example, reducing the cost of dismantling dismantling different parts uh, of uh, kinds of equipment that have plastics in them it needs to be to be made cheaper and easier. So there's all these elements that is uh, being sent upstream. Feedback being sent upstream. To, to reduce and make recycling more cost effective and also technologically feasible. Preventing dumping, uh, many, many countries have put in regulations, they are developing regulations to reduce dumping. Um, preventing of, prevention of dumping is also, once you create the business opportunities, it also has an impact of dumping, obviously, because once you create, uh, you add value to plastics, then you create uh, business opportunities, you create market opportunities, and this obviously reduces dumping. I remember in Seychelles when we put a price on on pet bottles. Uh, after a week, there was no pet bottles littering the environment. And and so so economic incentives, putting prices on plastic waste have have an impact on preventing dumping. And of course, in terms of combating pollution, I don't need to go into any detail here. But uh, we see um, many countries now looking at how they can combat. Uh, 
not only plastic pollution, because when you're dealing with plastic, you're dealing with also other types of waste as in terms of improving waste management, both at the community level, but also at the national level. Next slide, please. So the Blast Plast Basel Convention Plastic Waste Partnership was also a decision taken by the COP when they adopted the amendments. And it is currently co-chaired by uh, Ole Thomas Thomasen from Norway and Ross Badley from the uh, Bureau of uh, Recycling. So both uh, government and private sector involved. Today we have more than 100 members uh, combining both uh, governments, our private sector, as well as NGOs. And they are well advanced in the planning. And as you know, we had our first meeting earlier this year, just before we went into lockdown um, uh, in Seychelles. And they came out with four priority areas. And that is, of course, policy regulatory framework, environmentally sound management on plastic waste, the private sector and others collaboration. And finally, and I think this is the most transformational approach to dealing with plastics is changing the culture, outreach, education, and awareness raising. Because really um, the challenges there is, is, uh, is uh, changing the, the public and consumer perception on how we deal with plastics. Next slide, please. And finally, my final slide just gives you uh, just a brief uh, overview of where the Secretariat is, is, is acting. Of course, we've developed a lot of partnerships, uh, partnerships that we've never had before with the private sector, for example, with other NGOs, with other global initiatives. And the, the Secretariat is working very hard to see how we can support those initiatives as well in their work. And, and of course, on transboundary movement of plastic waste, this is very much a lot of technical work being done, for example, with the World Customs Organization to reclassify and, and put very clear um, indications in the harmonized system so that customs officers, when they are processing exports and imports of plastic waste, this is done in a very transparent and traceable manner. On ESM, we have uh, an expert working group who's been working diligently to develop the, the new uh plastic waste guidelines in uh, which is linked of course to the minimization of uh, generation of plastic waste but what we've seen is a lot of industries have come on board to look at how they can minimize plastic waste by reusing and i think that was mentioned by uh, uh by a colleague that you know there are now an increased use of recycled plastics in products so we, we we're taking the plastic waste we're recycling it and reusing it again which, which in fact, as I've said before, in plastics, this is no, a no-brainer. Plastics are polymers and they're designed to be recycled. They are made to be recycled. It's just that we've not been recycling them and we've not been setting up uh, systems and the technology available for us to recycle them. And I think this is the opportunity that we have now to, to go into developing those systems, both at industry uh, and at national levels to see. Uh, additives is an ongoing work. There are a number of organizations we're working with, including UN organizations, to look concretely at the issue of additives in plastics. We're working with industry, especially those in the manufacturing of plastic uh, polymers and um, resins. We've had a couple of discussions with some of these big chemical companies to see how we can have better plastics with less additives in them. Obviously, some types of plastics will need additives and how we can have environmentally uh, sound additives and not additives that are that are uh, related to hazard, hazardous chemicals or persistent organic pollutants. So the work is ongoing there. I think it's, uh, it's a quite a challenge, but I think if we keep pushing the needle here, we will see it moving. And of course, finally on the SDGs, this is very much linked to, to different elements of SDGs. There's gender issues, poverty issues, water issues, food issues, I, I mean, uh, we've been having discussions with FAO, for example, of the huge amount of plastic that is used in, in, in agricultural production to improve productivity, to improve uh, food production, and how we can move towards uh, a transition where we use less and less plastics, or we use the plastics in a much better way so that we can encourage uh, recycling of those plastics. So this, I hope I've, I've uh, put in some new and emerging issues that we are looking at in terms of uh, of what we are doing. With the support of the Norwegian government, we've now launched a small grants program. And the small grants program is to really uh, have projects on the ground. And this is being implemented through the regional centers. 
We've already awarded grants for this first round, and we're now considering grants for the second for the second round. And uh, with the support, and here you have all the flags of all the donors. Uh, we have the EU, France, Germany, Japan, uh, government of Norway, Finland, uh, Switzerland, and uh, and the Norwegian Development Agency, who are all supporting the work that we are doing in the in the BRX. Uh, with this, I will end. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hal, uh, for, for mapping what's going on uh, at the Basel Convention. Uh, I am now turning to Leticia, who will be uh, speaking about what UNEP is, uh, how UNEP is addressing marine litter. Leticia, the floor is yours. Can you hear me? Perfectly. Yes. Can you please? Uh, yes, I'm seeing my slides. Can you see me as well? Great. Excellent. And uh, actually, good day, colleagues. I couldn't be happier to join so many old friends in, in, in Geneva today. So thanks a lot for inviting me. It's a, really a pleasure. So as Rolf just mentioned, the international community is really active and engaged in, the, in, the, in, this, uh, in this subject. However, we still have a lot to get uh, effectiveness. And now definitely we have a new momentum and uh, we need to take this opportunity to uh, really stop the tide of uh, microplastics and plastics and, and litter uh, to the oceans, into the oceans. And th this is definitely a great momentum uh, to take important mass measures and effective measures. So, as you know, over the past decades, UNAP also joined hands in this effort uh, and has been addressing marine litter and microplastics under the Global Program of Action for the Protection of the Marine Environment from land-based activities, as you all know, uh, as GPA. In 2012, the Global Partnership on Marine Litter, yes, next slide, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm just in this one, great, thanks. Uh, in 20, in, in tw 2012, the Global Marine, the Global Partnership on Marine Leader was launched at the Rio Plus 20 conference. And the partnership is a voluntary mode stakeholder partnership of more than 270 partners at the moment. Since 2012, GPMA, GPML has been serving as the main implementation mechanism for UNAP's work on marine litter and microplastics. Next slide, please. Great. Uh, since 2014, the UN Environment Assembly has adopted four resolutions on marine litter and microplastics. In 2017, the Assembly decided to establish an ad hoc open-ended expert group, you all know as AHEC, on marine litter and microplastic through the resolution 3-7, paragraph 10. The expert group had an initial program of work to explore barriers to combating marine litter and microplastic, identify response options at the national, regional and international levels, and examine costs, benefits, feasibility and effectiveness of different response options. The mandate of the AHEG was extended to UNAIR Resolution 4-6, paragraph 7, in 2019. The assembly requested the expert group to build on the previous work and take stock of existing activities, identify technical and financial mechanisms, encourage partnerships and analyze the effectiveness of existing potential response options to address marine litter and microplastics. The expert group met four times and the last meeting was held earlier this month. Uh, Ingeborg just mentioned this. Uh, earlier in her statement. I will now briefly present the outcome of the work of the expert group and the future steps of UNAP work on marine litter and microplastics. This is slide, correct? Thank you. The fourth meeting of the ad hoc uh, and an expert group was held from 9 to 13 November 2020. The, mute, the meeting was held virtually with simultaneous interpretation in all UN languages. More than 80 member states and the 50 major groups of stakeholders participated in the meeting, precisely 79 member states plus EU. The meeting adopted the chair summary, which describes how the AHEG has delivered on its mandate from the AHEG 1 to AHEG 4. This summary informs the UN Environment Assembly on the range of options for its considerations, consideration as next steps. With the conclusion of the fourth meeting, 
The expert group concluded its mandate, and it is now up to the assembly to decide on the future steps to address marine litter and microplastics, as Felix just mentioned as well. Next slide, please. I would like to very briefly introduce the work of the AHAC uh, and uh, in, in particular summarize the chair's summary uh, elements in the, first, in the fourth meeting just held. The expert group work can be summarized particularly on three areas. First, review of the present situation. Second, identification of potential national, regional, and international response options. Third, identification of potential options for continued work for consideration by UNEA. For the interest of time, I will present the potential options for continued work for consideration by UNEA as identified by the expert group. This, the expert group identified response options that are not mutually exclusive. This is an important point to remind. The group also noted that these options are not exhaustive. The response options include a global common vision, national action plans and their implementation, regional and international cooperation to facilitate national actions, scientific basis, mood stakeholder engagement, strengthening of existing instruments, a new global instrument, and enhanced coordination among the existing instruments. Next slide, please. The chair of the group also noted that numerous participants expressed their view that the AHEC should recommend starting negotiations on a global agreement. On the other hand, the chair also noted that other participants expressed a preference for order response options. This can summarize the debate. The expert group also welcomed the UNAP executive director's willingness to organize informal preparatory consultations in support of the preparation for the resumed session of the fifth meeting of the UN, UN uh, Environment Assembly in this two steps approach, taking us to 2022. Next slide, please. So, colleagues, this outcome of the expert group will be fed into the fifth UN Environment Assembly for its deliberation. The outcome will also be fed into other policies, policy processes, such as the upcoming meeting of the Forum of Ministers of Environment of Latin America and Caribbean, which will be held in January 2021. UNEP will also continue to support supporting member states in addressing marine litter and microplastics through its global partnership on marine litter. We will continue with ongoing activities as the Clean Seas campaigns, you all know very well, and we will further strengthen the partnership as requested by UNEA 3 by establishing the GPML Digital Multi Stakeholder Platform and the GPML Action Tracks. I will briefly introduce these two activities, these two last activities I just mentioned on the, under the GPML. Uh, and please take us to the next slide. Great, thanks a lot. And the GPML action track, tracks will form an action-driven community and provide the backbone to operationalize urgent coordinated actions on marine litter and microplastics. GPML action tracks will encourage matchmaking, output-oriented partnerships, and filling gaps in the operationalization of priority areas as such. Science policy, national action plans, guidelines and standards harmonization, sustainable, innovative financing, and access to all. Next slide, please. The, G the D GPML digital platform is aiming to facilitate the work of the action tracks. UNEP is currently developing the GPML digital mood stakeholder platform in response to the request made by the assembly. A primary goal of the platform is to facilitate more informed decision making with a life cycle and source to see approach. I would be more bold here, source to fate approach, especially on policy levels, but also taking action on ad hoc and regular basis. As the digital arm of the GPML, the digital platform will also have 
matchmaking functions to facilitate the coordination of action between stakeholders, including through simple opportunities for content and sharing, and the GPML action tracks will facilitate regular basis action. You can see, colleagues, our conceptual architecture brings together internal and external databases. You can see in the left and in the right of my picture and other applications through a single point of entry called a virtual quarterback in the center of the slide. To the virtual quarterback, users will to access tools for simple data analysis, such as mapping or layering. They will also have access to more sophisticated tools for measuring or tracking progress. The digital platform will contribute to the world environmental situation room. You can see this is small square in the bottom in the right side of this slide. And engage multi multiple actors and resources to provide seamless experience for any user. We are invited interested partners to get in touch with us and join in this initiative. We expect the member states and other actors you can see described in the bottom in the center of the slide. As such, local, national, regional and international levels, including academia, industry and civil society to use the platform and join the global partnership on marine litter. Next slide, and this is my last. Yes, I just would like to say again, uh, it is really a valuable opportunity for, for UNEP and for myself to join you and uh, happy to continue in these dialogues. Thanks a lot. Over to you. Diana. Thank you very much, uh, Leticia. Before we move on on the agenda, I know we are running with time. I would like to thank who has already raised questions in the Q&A box on the WebEx platform uh, and ensure everybody that the figures that have been present, that the elements that have been mentioned will be uh, um, summarized on the web uh, page of this event. And as the presentations that have been made will also be available there. We, meet, we move on the agenda and we will now uh, discuss impacts of the global policies at the national level and some complementary actions. And I have the pleasure to turn to um, uh, Sam uh, Adou uh, Koumi. Uh, Ghana is a country that is facing uh, severe uh, plastic uh, pollution uh, problems. Uh, you have uh, some uh, um, stories to tell us. Sam, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, um, Diana. And um, good morning from Accra, Ghana. Um, to, um, I'm happy to be called upon this morning to partake in this very important dialogue. I'm very grateful. As Dana, you rightly said, Ghana is a country facing huge plastic pollution. In fact, plastic waste are all over and increasing daily, not just in our landfills, which we in fact we call dumping sites because um, very few well-engineered landfills are available in the country. And as a result, our drains are choked with plastics daily basis. Also, our soils are suffering. In fact, um, our farmers are bubbling with plastics in the soil due to non-biodegradability of majority of plastics used in the past. Our water, water bodies are not spared. In fact, our air is polluted due to indiscriminate burning of plastics. If I may mention, our nice coastal beaches have not been spared at all. And in fact, our fisher folks are already catching plastics in their fishing nets instead of fish. In a study we conducted in 2013, for example, we found plastics about 1,000 meters deep in the ocean. And if I may say also, the COVID-19 pandemic has exposed our vulnerability and continued dependence on plastics. Our masks and the, the packaging materials are all over the place. Unfortunately, our efforts as recycling lags behind the rate of disposal or polluting environment. Currently, we are doing less than 20% of waste recycling. Ghana has been very active, if I may say, and myself in particular, with many of the BRS, BRS conventions and other global and regional initiatives that deal with plastic menace. One may ask, therefore, what does Ghana bring to, what, or what does DPS bring to Ghana? Ghana stands to benefit from the following tools and practical manuals developed under the Basel Convention in particular in addressing plastic waste. An ESM toolkit 
which has been developed to help address topics such as informal sector, private sector incentives, a practical manual to ensure that notifications of transmodal movements meet environmental sound management requirements, a guidance for developing strategies towards prevention and minimization of plastic waste, and also the Basel Convention technical guidelines for the identification and ESM of plastic waste at their disposal. Again, under the BRS NORAD pilot projects in Ghana, are mar on marine litter and microplastics. The following have been developed and are being developed. We have a draft framework for developing ESM strategies for plastic waste reduction and management. A draft, a, a plastic, a draft plastic waste inventory toolkit, which is expected to complement the draft practical guidance on the development of inventory of plastic waste. Both are being tested in Ghana. So again, what complementary measures are we taking in addressing the waste menace? In fact, Ghana is leveraging on the technical assistance provided under the BRS North Pilot Project to undertake the following activities. Rolling out our national, we are taking, undertaking legal and institutional reforms. We are trying to roll out um, our national plastic management policy, which has been already been launched. We are amending our national act, mainly the 917 and the LI 2350, to actually um, take up the Basel Amendment. We are training customs and also undertaking awareness raising for identified stakeholders. We are developing a comprehensive national strategy for ESM of plastic waste. We are developing curriculum reforms for schools and academia. We are building on piloted incentives and collecting schemes, example, providing compensation to fisher folk to return their discarded fishing nets for ESM or for recycling. And also, we are increasing our research activities to stop importation of plastic waste as well. So, to end my short presentation, the question is, what next? What policies need to be addressed globally to tackle the plastic waste? And I must say, no one country can work alone. Plastic waste is a transboundary issue. Policy initiatives and innovative activities should be introduced, as mentioned by Rolf Pae over the BRS Secretariat. We need to build on ongoing international actions and work done, particularly under the Basel Convention, promoting ESM and recycling using the tools and manuals, guidance and guidelines that have been developed, we should adopt them for our national and regional activities. Developing countries and countries with economic interaction also still require technical and financial assistance as well as uh, technology transfer. So thank you very much once again for the kind um, attention and for the opportunity to also take part. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Um... I am now turning again to Felix and to Ingeborg uh, to have a, 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 um, a developed country perspective on, on this dimension of, uh, um, of the impact of the global policies at the national level and the complementary actions. I see that Felix, uh, you have you unmuted yourself, please. Thank you very much. Yes, I'm happy to share some experience what we have done in Switzerland so far and how we see that is related to international level. So on a national level, the first thing that we have done was trying to better understand the issue. So to further analysis, to understand the material flows, to know the sources and so on, is the aim to create effective policy, policy measures. And the general response at the national level is to work primarily on mitigation. And in those areas that contribute mostly to the generation of plastic waste. In our case, it's a lot of higher operation and emerging more agriculture. So there means specific measures we are going to, to, to test and to try and to see what we have to implement. Could be, for example, very concrete measures on those waste of the, those uh, material streams, for example, the labeling for eco-friendly tires, or introducing biodegradable plastics in agriculture. However, Switzerland intends also to work on an early stage of the life cycle that concerns design, packaging, and recycling. So, for example, to brief the design of products and packaging to reduce the quantity, we 
can encompass incentive, incentives to selling food without packaging or to reduce the single use of plastics, the use of single use plastics. For sure, we also to check on behavioral changes. So one project is also that we reduce substantively this littering. So when people are throwing away plastics on the streets, it's kind of behavioral change that we reduce that because that is some one of the sources that end up in the river and then in the ocean. We have also seen that this is a policy, where the politics are really taking up this issue. They are concerned about it. And the government has just been tasked by the parliament to develop measures in cooperation with the private sector to reduce the use of plastics and enhance sustainable management. As mentioned before, we're very aware that this is not an issue you can deal and resolve on a national level, it's linked to international level. And we see that many government initiatives, projects and responses and options have been developed. However, the existing measures are punctual responses, for example, around waste management. And they're not sufficient to cope with the amount of plastic that we will produce now or even in the future. So we are thinking a lot, how can we, what can we do to support national level to create this linkage? And we see that we have to use, to make use of all the existing instruments that we have, like the legally binding, like the Basel Convention, all the approaches like SICAM, but we're also supporting the call for global framework to deal with this issue. We have seen examples like the Basel Convention, the improved uh, amendment of the plastic that Norway has introduced. Um, this, in, this peak procedure is not targeting the beginning of the life cycle of plastics. However, it has a positive impact on the whole life cycle because we have we gathered, first of all, like more information about the waste streams, but also because we enhance responsibility to deal with the waste we are creating. This creates also kind of a thinking around and enhances policymakers to think about the whole cycle and develop measures to reduce the plastic use. Um, I think also that in on the SICAM we have to, to further discuss it. Voluntary approaches like SICAM have an advantage. The case of SICAM is that it's multi-sectorial, multi-stakeholder. So it's we have civil society, academia, private sector, and governments working together. And one idea we have there we'd like to look further into and develop it is how can we use standards? So how can we enhance the quality of standards, the use of standards? to tackle in the whole uh, value chain in different sectors, to reduce the use of plastic, to reduce the hazardous substances in plastic, to improve design. That could be one approach. And as mentioned before, a lot can be done in existing instruments by adapting them, by using their strengths, by better coordinating them. But in our analysis, those are remains punctual efforts and we see the need for coordinated response through a global framework. Thank you very much. Ingeborg, please, you can continue the discussion. Thank you very much, um, Diana. And um, in response to the global attention that we did see from the first UNEA in 2014, Norway assessed our major sources of marine litter and microplastics. And uh, a lot of the plastic waste that we find along the Norwegian coastline originate from our own sources in the north, notably fisheries and aquaculture, and in the southern parts of Norway, mostly from consumer goods. And in 2020, the Norwegian Environment Agency has presented a revised assessment of the measures that we need to implement in Norway. And as part of the European Economic Area, we will have to implement a number of EU legislation in this area. Notably, the Single Use Plastics Directive will be implemented in Norway as of July 2021. We're also now in the process of revising our national plastic strategy. And this strategy builds on our 2017 strategy and is indeed guided by the global ambition uh, agreed at UNEA 3 to eliminate all discharge of plastic litter into the ocean. And this strategy reflects how the global policy discussion has moved now into addressing plastics across the whole life cycle and also to all the different environmental media. Norway will also implement the Basel amendments as of 1st of January 2021. And as an EEA country, we will accept the revised EU regulation on transboundary transport of waste. And in one direction, this regulation is actually stricter than was what was agreed at the Basel Convention last year. It introduces a ban on exports of Basel regulated plastic waste from the EU and EEA countries to non-OECD countries. 
But we realize that there are other regions in the world where this problem is a lot bigger than what it is in Norway. So back in 2018, we also introduced a development aid program of a total of 1.6 billion Norwegian kroners. This program is now extended until 2024 and it will assist countries in the regions most affected to put in place ambitious uh, policies. And what we have agreed to on the global level this far has been guiding our priorities also for the development aid program. But we see that we need to have a better coordinated approach and to have a dedicated meeting place and a number of these key functions that we are looking for in a new global agreement. So thank you very much. Over to you, Diane. Thank you very much, Ingeborg and Felix, uh, for uh, providing these uh, perspectives. We are moving on to the next point and we apologize for being late with time. Uh, we will hear from David Azoulay of Ciel um, on the importance of the international law to address the plastic crisis and, and some also uh, civil society perspectives. David, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know if you can put up the slide deck, but yes. So good morning and afternoon, everyone. As an NGO speaker on an event on plastic waste crisis, I know that I'm at least partly expected to marinate you in, we can go to the next slide. I'm at least partly expected to marinate you in figures and images. It will make you indignant and realize the severity and the scandal. The plastic issue is slightly different and not only because government now make the pitch that NGO usually do in those meetings. But mostly it's different because I don't need to tell you about the hundreds of containers full of garbages being sent to the Philippines, Thailand, Sri Lanka, Turkey, Kenya, or else place. I do not need to show you this stuff is being dumped on impoverished people and poisoning their food, water, and whole communities. I don't need to tell you about plastic waste flows and microplastic concentration in the environment and in people. I don't need to tell you all this because you already know all about this. And don't get me wrong, I could very well tell you horror stories that, you, that would make your heart jump and that would make you indignant. But, and also, don't get me wrong, it is very important to develop our understanding and knowledge of the various impacts of plastic. But that's not really why we're here. Because the fact that you all know about this, and as is very well demonstrated by this uh, seminar and by this series, uh, and the fact that the whole world knows about this has triggered a massive uh, political ambition and a massive response and reaction. So what I do want to talk to you about is how do we turn this combination of public awareness and political ambition into something that is actually a viable, sustainable solution that respects the planetary boundaries and rights of current and future generation? Uh, I think we can go to the next slide, thanks. Um, and before we get into this detail, I want to make a few points clear and maybe repeat some of the points that were made by earlier speaker. Yes, plastic is a global issue. It has global supply chain. It has global impact. There's no way any country, whether a highly developed uh, country uh, such as Switzerland or Norway or a country in transition or a developing countries such as Ghana or others can protect themselves from this issue on their own. Another thing that is very important to note is that while we are focusing a lot about the ocean, the plastic crisis is not an ocean issue. All compartment of the environment, whether it's the air, the soils on which we grow our food, the water, whether it's fresh or ocean, the 8,000 meters altitude glacier on top of the Everest, all of them are heavily contaminated with macro and microplastic. So it is important for us to put that in our frame of mind as we think of possible solutions. And the last uh, base or uh, ground points that I would want to make is that plastic crisis is not just a waste issue. And I know we're on a, a, a plastic and waste uh, themed event today, and I don't want to minimize the role and importance of the health aspect, of the um, uh, waste aspect of the plastic crisis, but really, we're identifying health and environment impacts all along the life cycle of plastic. And uh, looking at the figures, looking at the uh, scientific studies that have come out, there is no way we're gonna address this issue just by asking uh, consumers to put their garbage in a, in a particular uh, bag 
or by increasing collecting, or even with the fantasy that we could recycle all of our plastic. Not only do we recycle only 7% of the plastic right now, but contrary to something that was said earlier, plastic is not designed for recycling. Plastic is designed currently today for single use. Some of it can be recycling, recycled, but it's more of a, a second thought and an afterthought that, um, than something else. Uh, next slide, please. So the, the good news is we are making progress and we're not starting from scratch. We heard about the Basel Plastic Amendment now, uh, and we heard about the hopes that the Basel Plastic Amendment would have impacts beyond the, uh, the mere transboundary movement of plastic waste and that it will trigger a whole cascade of activities and changes in practice in what are currently now exporting countries. Uh, but what we're really seeing right now, as we look at how countries are looking at implementing this, we're looking at incomplete transpositions. We're looking at countries cutting corners to allow to continue business as usual. We're looking at countries claiming that they can use certain provisions of the Basel Convention, such as the Article 11, to conclude trade agreements that will allow them to completely circumvent the provisions of both the plastic amendment and the ban amendment. So there is a real importance for us to look at how the Basel plastic amendment will actually be implemented and, and enforced. Because of course, we know enforcement is the challenge. We know that there can be some very nice uh, rules on the book. And again, the plastic amendment under Basel is not a ban of transboundary movement of plastic waste. It's merely a possibility for countries to refuse to receive those kinds of waste. But we know about corruptions, we know about illegal shipments of plastic waste, we know that a lot of those plastic waste really shouldn't be moving across borders today, and yet they are. So we will need to go further. And I have more good news for you. We're not starting from scratch. A lot of work is being done about what could a global response, comprehensive response to the crisis looks like. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and a lot of these ideas have already put forward by some of the previous speakers. We need to coordinate the existing instruments that exist. The Basel, the Stockholm, the IMO, the WIPO for standards, and other existing instruments and work being done by institutions. In order to do this, we need to harmonize methods and guidelines for monitoring, for collecting information, and for comparing the possible efficiency of national measures. And about national measures, of course, we need to coordinate those national measures to ensure that one country's solution is not another country's problem. For this to happen, we also need global standard. It was pointed out by speakers before me, a lot of the plastic that comes in the market today is not recyclable, and that is unacceptable. So we need standards to be put in place to ensure that the plastic that, being, that is being put on the market respects a number of standards that allow a possible solution. We will need science and we'll need coordination of science and we'll need science to inform the decision that will need to be taken. We will need technology, probably, and technology transfers, uh, but noting that technology will not magically save us out of this situation. And of course, for all of this to work, we need money. We need a dedicated financial instrument, probably, or at least we need dedicated sources of funding that will support all the activities that have been identified as necessary to address the issue. Uh, next slide, please. Of course, we're not the only one thinking about this. And those of you who are a little familiar with international law will have recognized the basic elements of a new treaty that was mentioned already by a number of speakers. And yes, uh, together with a number of countries, I think now the count is at 126, who have made ministerial or heads of state declarations supporting a globally, a legally binding global instrument to address plastic along this whole life cycle. And if you want to know more about this, in the slide, I include a particular leaflet that is available in all six UN languages that is one of the ideas that have been put forward about what this global response could look like, how it could be structured, and what are the different elements. Many other countries have put uh, some of those elements forward, from the Nordic Council, 
to Vietnam in the context of the AHEG to other organizations, to even a large number of multinational that are also now calling for a global response, even though some probably the global response they're calling for might be a little different to what we're thinking of. Uh, next slide, please. So all of this is, is moving forward. We now have over 120 countries in all regions that um, support this particular uh, instrument. Of course, now I'm, I'm about to conclude now to mention that because the plastic is multifaceted, very multifaceted, and in fact, the whole structure of this series of events that were put together by the GEN is a good demonstration. We need to look at what is the impact on trade. We'll need to look at the health angle to ensure that this will, uh, this will be addressed. We need to address at which, how, what and how human rights are being impacted along the life cycle. Uh, and this is the reason why we're very excited. I really want to thank Jane for the organization of this particular event. I want to thank all of the participants who went in there. And one of the reasons why I'm extremely interested and looking forward to continue discussing with you, because in order to come up with a truly global comprehensive solution, that will not force us to come back 10 years from now and look at those small uh, health thought solutions uh, that we could have put in place and that the problem is not solved. So in order to avoid this, we need everybody's contribution. We need to have trade experts. We need to have standards experts. We need experts, human rights experts, climate air pollution experts that come together and develop what this comprehensive global solution could look like and ensure that the future tre treaty that I strongly believe we will uh, start negotiating uh, in a few months or a few years from now really addresses the question and really gives a chance to our future generations. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, um, David, uh, for this uh, excellent presentation and summarizing also some of the next steps. I know we are late with time, but I see there also that the, in the Q&A box, there are a lot of uh, questions. So I, what I propose is that uh, because the idea of this, uh, this uh, dialogue is also to uh, support coordinated approach that can lead to more efficient decision making and to, to feed the next uh, dialogues and the high level uh, dialogue that will close this uh, series of uh, events. I propose to, to, to have a quick look um, at some of the questions uh, and then we, we conclude uh, the event. Uh, so I'm giving the floor to Malou to summarize uh, some of the important questions that could feed the, the, the discussion. Yes, hi, um, we have a couple of questions and I will address uh, one from Ralitza Naidinova from the Graduate Institute. She asks whether bioplastics are actually a solution or a new problem and what global governance mechanisms are there to ensure that this new material does not confuse consumers and burden recycling systems. Another question from Antoinette Vermillier. What is the impact of countries that are trying to tie their trade agreements into forcing countries to accept plastic waste as part of the deal? How will this be addressed and will it also include social injustice as a factor as this mainly affects uh, the poor and uh, minorities? And another question from Didier Manjan from uh, Sea Cleaner Switzerland. A significant part of these plastics exportations finishes in the oceans. How can this issue be addressed? Thank you. Diana, you're on mute. Uh, sorry, <laughs> I was saying that I don't see, uh, uh, I saw that Ralf put his camera off. I don't know if he wants to start. Otherwise, David, please go ahead, sir. Uh, <clears throat> thanks, and thanks for those good questions. I'll try to uh, uh, address this quick. Are bioplastic a solution or a new problem? If by bioplastic, we mean a plastic that is sourced not from oil and gas feedstock, but from uh, uh, agricultural waste or from uh, other types of sources, I'm afraid that uh, 
it is actually a new problem rather than a full solution. Well, it does address some of the aspects of the production. The plastic that we create in such way is very much the same, the same type of polymer. It contains the same type of additives. It has the same kind of a long lasting life. And there is not much that we can that we can actually do about it. So the amount and accumulation of plastic waste that we're seeing now would not stop because we start using different feedstock. And it will in parallel raise a number of issue about what we use our uh, farmland for. Do we use it to produce packaging and plastic films or do we use it to produce food in, in, in a sustainable manner to feed the whole population? What instrument currently uh, ensures that this is properly addressed at the global level? Well, not, which is why we're being here and which is why we're seeing this uh, large mobilization of countries around developing a global solution to this issue. Uh, there was a question about the risk of trade agreement to circumvent the plastic amendment and others. Absolutely. I mentioned that in my, um, in, uh, in my presentation. And those of you who read a little of the New York Times or others will have heard about the proposed trade agreement between Kenya and the US, for example, where the industry is really hoping, the, the US industry wrote to the US government to hope and ensure that this trade agreement will allow Kenya to receive a large amount of plastic waste from the US, which is currently forbidden by the new plastic amendment as the US is not a party to the, to the Basel Convention. And they're even hoping that, the, that Kenya can be used as a gateway to the rest of Africa for Africa to deal with the US American uh, plastic waste. Of course, it's done under the guise of, but it's a great opportunity for Africa to start recycling our plastic. But if it was such a great opportunity, I would assume that this would be done nationally. I think uh, all countries could use these kinds of additional um, industrial activity. Uh, finally, uh, I think the last question was, uh, how do we uh, develop a full solution? Is that true? How do we uh, address this solution globally? Well, by coming together, by looking at this issue comprehensively, by showing ambition, not delay, and by not waiting that until it is too late. So by developing full solution at the global level, as all the participants into this webinar are currently doing and are pushing forward. Thanks. Thank you, David. Ralph, I turn to you. Ralph, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Sorry. Um, I, I think the, 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 when we talk about plastics, it's much more complex than this. We did a quick search and we have 150,000 different types of plastic. So just to funnel it down into simply, you know, one type of plastic, I think uh, it will, it will uh, stop us from really looking at this issue as it is. For example, pet that we are drinking, there's, no, there's not really any additives in there and this can be recycled. And already we've seen many companies who are increasing the recycle level. So again, my point is that we have not been recycling plastics enough. 9% is just not enough because there's not been the rules, the framework, and of course the incentives for industry to recycle those plastics. It's a bit cheaper for them to, because plastic is cheap, to make them single use and then throw it away. But when you talk about something that has got additives for, for UV, for example, for for stopping water absorbent, absorbing, for example, in mini clothing, like in ski clothing and all this, that's a totally different cup of tea. And, and you need to have the specialized industries who are producing this to look at the life cycle approach. So, so there's not one solution for dealing with plastics and, 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 and that, that illustrates the complexity of it. But at the end of the day, at the, at the basic of, of using plastics, all plastics can be recycled if it is designed properly, because they are polymers, they are basic polymers. And that's why in nature, nature also uses a lot of polymers, but they are biodegradable because bacteria can act on them to degrade them. And that's what completes the cycle in our, on, on our planet. But when we overload the cycle, obviously we have problems. So plastics is the same way. Compared to metals, compared to other complex materials that we use, plastics, has the potential to be recycled. And, and industry knows that very well. And, and of course, the, the, the oil industry is not too happy about this because they will sell less fuel, less oil for, for making plastics, we recycle all the plastics. 
so so there is a great opportunity there for 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 us to look at this now at the end uh, i mean uh, david has raised a lot of points about international law and how we imply implement it and and the gaps there will always be gaps there's no perfect solution to anything and and i think what Basel Convention has attempted to do is to try to address from an international law perspective uh, to deal with the issue of plastics. And, and law is not enough. There is a lot of other components that need to come together. Economic, as mentioned before, incentives, disincentives, uh, dealing with illegal trade, uh, proper enforcement. All these are the different components, but these are all heavy, heavy things to lift. And each country has a sovereign country of their own internal policies and measures. All we can do is create that capacity, create that space, create that push, motivate political commitment for this to happen. And indeed, um, since a year now, since we've been talking about this issue of plastics in the last four or five years, um, we don't have a clear data on whether there's been a decrease in, in the amount of plastics in the environment. We need to have good monitoring systems. Our monitoring is now all over the place. We, we don't have a clear indication whether those actions are, are actually leading to a reduction of plastics. But at the end of the day, this, will not stop, this should not stop us from taking real action. And all actions, all actions I will repeat today, from the, from the consumer in putting the right, the right plastic in the right bin, from the consumer reducing consumption on, on the, all the way to the work of industry, to the work of policymakers, they all have a role to play in dealing with the issue of plastics. I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Ralph. I think we can continue with Leticia. Yes, thanks a lot. I don't know exactly how to raise my hands <laughs> in the Webex, so apologies for that. And thanks for the opportunity to touch upon some of the of the questions and provide some answers. Um, so first, taking taking uh, in consideration the issue of the biodegradability, so I just would like to highlight that this, this is definitely one of the areas uh, that we need more science behind. Uh, but I would like to recall that uh, we, we have actually, uh, based on one of the mandates uh, of UNEA, uh, a development of an assessment of sources, pathways and harms of marine litter and microplastics. This is going, this is about to be launched uh, in the next February next year. But uh, it is uh, one of the major findings that I would like to share is definitely the issue of the environmental fate of the plastics in the ocean and in the in the ecosystems and in the, in the nature. And uh, definitely uh, there is uh, uh, an important aspect that we still need to unfold. But I, I very much uh, uh, peek on what David just mentioned. This is a, a, a this sounds at the moment based on our findings. Uh, to be more at the side of a problem than at the side of a solution. So to include, and this was what I mentioned in my, uh, uh, in my, uh, in my uh, chance to speak to you, that the fate, the source to fate element and the environment of fate is definitely uh, a point that we need to look despite all of the value chain uh, in, the, in, the, in the plastic uh, value chain. We also need to take, keep an eye and really go in depth, uh, understanding on the role of the environmental fate of this, uh, uh, of the plastic in the oceans. So another point, uh, picking on, on, on the same aspect, uh, uh, David mentioned, and, uh, in terms of the need to have, uh, a, a connection and an interaction, uh, perspective, interactive perspective of the all com compartments, uh, uh, in this, in this problem. Uh, and definitely, I want to say that UNEP is, is, is basing uh, its work in the Global Program of Action for Protection of Marine Environment from land-based activities. And in this platform, in this program, uh, we take in consideration all the interactions between ocean, atmosphere, and all uh, ecosystems from land into the oceans. So this vision that is comprehensive and holistic and takes in consideration the problem of marine litter is actually entailed in a comprehensive and holistic perspective, perspective that uh, take as, as, a, as an anchor uh, all the interactions between the different ecosystems, including fresh water. So this perspective is something that is very valuable and we don't want to lose it at all. And uh, despite we have this momentum for marine litter, uh, I just would like to flag that in our understanding, we see uh, the comprehensiveness uh, uh, of the problem and we definitely are also looking in a comprehensive uh, 
a structure that can respond to the complexity of the subject. So, um, yeah, and also uh, finally, just to really uh, pick on, on, on Rolf's point on Basel Convention, the tremendous contribution Basel is doing really uh, uh, to, to, to fill the gaps that we have in the moment and to ensure capacity uh, in, at, at, at national level, uh, definitely uh, uh, this is one of the major values that we need to uh, take in consideration and most of the major values that we found as uh, uh, as uh, uh, existing actions. So um, I see the importance to really uh, any future agreement on, on this uh, has to build upon the strengthens of the instruments that we are ha already have in place. And of course, as David mentioned, uh, overcome uh, the weaknesses and the gaps that are remaining. I will stop here. Thank you very much for that. Thank you, Leticia. I know we are late with time. I will turn to Sam, to Ingeborg, and to Felix uh, to see if they have something they want to add to what has been said. Maybe we start with you, Sam. Yes, thank you very much, um, Diana, once again. I think I don't have much to add to what has been said. I believe that development countries and countries with economic transition actually have a, also a big role and responsibility to really help. I mean, get rid of this menace of plastics. And I believe that um, with the support from the international community and um, our developed partners also, we can go, I mean, uh, forward and then implement those policies that will help get rid of the menace. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sam. Ingeborg? Oh, Felix? If you want to add something, I know you, you please. Diana, Ingeborg. I will unmute you. This no, is Ingeborg. Let me just say yeah. that I would like to thank everyone for sharing their perspectives uh, this morning and a very engaging dialogue. And I already look forward to the next one. Thank you. Thank you, Ingeborg. Indeed, the, the, the discussion will continue at the next sessions uh, on some of the topics that have been mentioned by various of our panelists today. And Felix, a last word before we move on to the closure. Thank you very much. No, I don't have to add a lot. I think it was uh, also a good question. There's also a discussion of substitute that they have to be better than the original one. I think that's very key. And that will be one of the things to consider for further actions. I just have to thank everybody for the intervention, for the contributions, and for you, Diana, and, uh, and UNEP and the regional office for organizing this event. And we're very much looking forward to continuing discussions. Thank you, Felix. I see, David, that you have raised a hand. Do you want to add the final word, as you have been mentioned by some of the panelists in their last remarks? Well, and thank you very much, and I'm sorry to keep everybody waiting. Uh, I do want to thank everyone. I do look forward to the future uh, conversation. And maybe one thing that I would, one word that I would leave, try to leave all the participants with is, it is a complex issue. And I want to caution us all against magical thinking. There will not be one single solution that will get us out of this. Recycling is interesting, but the vast majority of plastic cannot be recycled either technically or economically. A global instrument will be useful, but it will not be the silver bullet either. National action, regional action, global action, individual actions, actions from consumers, action and efforts from industries, from recyclers and others, all of this will be needed. So this is why I really look forward to getting the perspective from all the different sectors and to move beyond uh, possible magical thinking and really get into designing proper comprehensive solution for all. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. I think we could all uh, reply, and, and but the discussion will continue at the next session. So we will move on now to the, the conclusion of this event. Uh, we want, of course, to thank all the panelists that were with us uh, today and, and you who are online.